Okay, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about the topic, how many calories stop autophagy and fasting benefits and dry fasting in there as well. So obviously we're going to be tackling this topic today, which is a topic I am pretty sure almost every single faster has asked at least once during their fasting journey. How many calories is too much? Or how many calories is just enough? Well, health is different for each person and it changes all the time. What happens in your body when you eat a little bit of food can depend on the time of day, your genetic profile, and so many other factors. And a lot of this plays into insulin, a hormone that only lasts a few minutes in our body and helps control our sugar levels. So insulin is a really key player. Insulin doesn't just react to the food that we eat. Other things can affect it too. And we're also going to have to talk a lot about autophagy because that's one of the main uh, points of this discussion and how autophagy cleans out and fixes our cells, but really how is it triggered? And if you've been following this work for a while or you've been diving into fasting research, you've probably heard of mTOR and AMPK. Think of them as opposing forces. mTOR is for growth, AMPK is for fasting. So these levels change a lot and we really have to dive in to start to understand them a little bit better. For example, uh, it's important to know that stress can change how our body deals with sugar and insulin. When we're stressed, our body makes a hormone called cortisol, and this can make our sugar and insulin levels go up. This shows uh, us how our body's reaction to food and stress is complicated and why everyone needs to think about their own health in their own way. It's also important to remember that during a fast, a lot of rules change, even rules involving cortisol and insulin. For example, without liver glycogen, cortisol plays a slightly different role. And if this is starting to cause some light bulb moments for you, you might realize that people will right away say, don't drink coffee because it spikes your insulin or your sugar levels, but they don't understand the correlation with liver glycogen. When you're in a slightly deeper fast, you have no liver glycogen and the rules change. One of the main things I want to get out of the way, and I think most of you are looking for, is examining the actual calorie numbers when it comes to autophagy. What's okay, what's not. If you came here for me to give you an exact number, well, you're sorely mistaken because there's no such thing. Um, as I mentioned, it is unique to everybody, but we can sort of play around with a bunch of different numbers of, that have been thrown around over the years. And if you've looked into this topic before, probably one of the most common old school numbers that have been thrown around has been 50 calories. So if you eat under 50 calories, according to this theory, you can maintain a fasted state. I'm pretty sure this came from the Bulletproof diet back in the day. I was like way over 10 years ago. So the Bulletproof coffee is part of that Bulletproof diet, and it's a popular drink for people who are fasting. So it would be look something like having a coffee in the morning with their butter or an oil called MCT oil. You've probably heard of that, a derivative of coconut oil. So those medium chain triglycerides act completely differently than other fats, and they are very interesting. And we're probably not going to talk too much about them, but you can play around with these ketone-inducing MCT oils. Another number that has been thrown around for autophagy comes from the Buchinger Wilhelmi Clinic. So I don't know if any of you have looked into their site, but they are a pretty big fasting clinic. I think they're in Germany. And they claim that you can still see health benefits from fasting eating up to 250 calories a day and while doing moderate exercise. So I'm assuming that that definition um, takes into consideration that you are exercising throughout the day to sort of um, 
maintain low levels of glycogen in the body. So when fasting, your body gets energy from stored fat. At the same time, it uses a process called autophagy to get important building blocks like amino acids from itself to make the necessary proteins. The less food you eat, the more your body relies on autophagy to get those parts. That's why drinking coffee or tea, which doesn't have protein, fat, or a lot of carbs, probably doesn't negatively affect autophagy. I know that some people truly believe with, with their whole soul that you cannot touch coffee or tea on a fast, and I'd like to debate that a little bit, but I'm just going to answer with one word, debatable. Okay, so since I can't give you an exact number when it comes to this question, and I've basically told you it's nearly impossible to find the exact number for you, let's look into things that stop autophagy so that you can sort of paint a better picture for yourself. Autophagy is a cellular process vital for maintaining health, and it can be stopped through several factors. Uh, mainly through dietary components and hormonal changes. What we need to know is that glucose and protein are usually what activate mTOR. And like we talked about, mTOR is the opposite of what we want if we want to be in a fasted state. So when you consume glucose and protein, they trigger an insulin release, which in turn activates mTOR, inhibiting autophagy. Cortisol, the stress hormone, also plays a role in hindering this process, likely due to its effect on metabolic pathways, and also just merely the act of eating, usually irrespective of macronutrient composition, can temporarily pause autophagy. Interestingly, fats have the least effect on insulin and thus are the least suppressive to autophagy and why we see so many fats. Uh, being used, especially MCT oil, medium chain triglycerides, and even prepping for a fast by eating a high fat diet and sort of inducing ketosis and just getting your cells sort of accustomed to a higher fat environment. When I wrote about using coffee earlier, I have a link or you can look up the article how coffee can help you dry fast. I didn't go too deeply into the cortisol effects, um, and we know that caffeine stimulates cortisol release, but it's also an autophagy inducer, and science has known this for a really long time. They don't know exactly why, but they know that coffee and green tea are autophagy inducers, and that's why you see them very often in fasting mimicking diets. So things get very complicated. But basically, cortisol release earlier on in the fast shouldn't be too much of a problem because we are not in a deep fasted state yet. But as the dry fast continues, especially past day three, so think day three and up, cortisol levels naturally skyrocket. We don't want to be adding to that with coffee. So stopping exogenous cortisol stimulants as soon as possible is better. That's why obviously not having coffee is ideal. But if you want to biohack or you are in a situation where you just cannot get off of it for some reason, then maybe you can play around with having it at least a maximum of 36 hours into a fast and using that as like your brick wall cutoff point. And just to quickly touch on the HPA axis and cortisol, so we have the HPA axis, which is the hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal axis, and coffee does stimulate the cortisol release. So what we need to realize here is that cortisol makes your liver put out a lot of sugar into your blood because it's kind of like your run and your fight or flight hormone, and it wants to give you energy so you can do what you need to do to get out of there. But this is dependent on glycogen stores. That's why after X amount of time, 12 hours, it is not, the glycogen is not a factor anymore. And you have to understand that without just being like, coffee is bad, activates the HPA axis, therefore never use it, and it's only negative. So if you haven't eaten for a long time, things change. Okay, so we talked about things that stop autophagy, and now what about promote autophagy? 
We said mTOR is bad for autophagy, so now we're looking at AMPK, the other side, yin and yang. So AMPK is good. What activates AMPK? It's usually caloric restriction, then regular exercise and prolonged fasting periods. Of course, there are some supplements that are pretty good. First things that come to mind are things like berberin, so things that really stabilize your blood sugar levels or lower them. And there are a few other foods. And honestly, there are actually supplements that promote AMPK, but yet are not advised for fasting. So don't base your supplement intake simply on them raising AMPK levels like NMN supplements or any NAD boosting supplements. Basically keep it simple and it is caloric restriction, exercise, and fasting. We also have this thing called the GIP, which is a hormone from your small intestine and it amplifies insulin's effect. And what we know here is that it gets mostly stimulated by carbs and the least by fats. That just further provides evidence that carbs are going to knock you out of autophagy very quickly, but fats are going to do much better. Okay, and we're going to finish off on, do we have to suffer through low energy fasting? Since we know that AMPK gets activated with a low energy state, does it mean that we have to be forced to suffer through these states during fasting? The answer is yes, especially in the beginning. The start of the fasting process is marked by a huge energy crash. The severity is dependent on diet. So if you're coming in from a fat adapted, low carbohydrate diet, it's going to be much easier uh, on, than if your body was already used to burning ketones. The question that floats around is, does being fat adapted lower the benefits of the induced stress fasting is supposed to provide? And the answer is possibly. I do believe that a deeper low energy situation both increases the benefits of fasting, but also makes it harder to perform. So you have to find the sweet spot. What does it mean in simpler terms? Basically, if you're coming from a zero carb diet, you might get less benefits than if you are coming in from a higher carb diet. As you progress throughout the fast, you'll notice that there's also this thing called the acidotic crisis, which you can hit around day two or three. Think of it like the, a reef in the ocean. Once you get through the waves, you're back on open, calm waters. What happens during this time? Your body adapts to the free fatty acids that are floating around, and also it starts to burn them more quickly. So you're supposed to get this dry fasting heat. When this happens, because if your body has adapted correctly, it's burning these free fatty acids at higher rates. So now you feel better. But your body has also stabilized energy levels to a better degree. Higher cortisol levels are also helping burn through, through the fat faster and converting it to glucose via gluconeogenesis from glycerol. And at this point, if you're taking in any form of supplemental energy, you may be throwing off a lot of the healing, a lot of the autophagy. What's the point? Well, make sure you stop ingesting anything about 36 hours into the fast and let your body do its thing. Think of it like dominoes. They all have to hit and one by one start the chain reaction. What I'm trying to say is that the first 36 hours, there's not a lot of dominoes at play here. But once you pass 36 hours, mess any one of the next dominoes and you mess up the whole chain reaction and you'll have to restart. So to finish off, while a single calorie might not significantly impact autophagy, the type and amount of calories consumed are critical. For instance, ingesting 10 grams of carbs, especially if one's health is compromised, could interrupt autophagy for a short duration, more so than if you took in 10 grams of fat. This interruption uh, duration is influenced by factors such as individual metabolic rates, insulin sensitivity, and the specific nutrient profile of the ingested food. That's it for today's discussion. I hope you learned something new and you can use this information to improve your own fasting journey. Until next time, good luck on your healing journey. Thanks for sticking around. If you've dry fasted before, have any questions or requests for future topics, please leave them in the comments below. I always check the comments for inspiration and ideas. 
If you're looking for a chat or to set up your dry fasting plan, check out the dryfastingclub.com website and subscribe. You should also check out the Discord community where you can meet other new and experienced dry fasters. Remember, no two people are the same, so every fasting experience is unique. Thank you and good luck on your dry fasting journey.